whether you're doing an entire van build, customising what you have, or trying to fix a fault, joining wires is something you will probably have to do when you're working on your electrics. In this two-part series, we're first in this video going to look at different methods of joining wires, and in the second video we will look at how different ways to use a multimeter that will help you with your build and finding faults. Keep watching! Don't forget to check out our other videos on everything campervan and motorhome related, from solar to water, heating to gadgets, tyres to trips. If you like this video, please do hit the thumbs up, it really does help me to know what you like, and you can ask any questions or give feedback in the comments. If you want to make sure you don't miss any of our future videos, please hit the subscribe button and clicking the bell will give you a notification when a new video goes live. Finally, if you do decide to hit the thumbs down, it would be great if you could also leave a comment so I'd know what you didn't like. In this video I'm going to share examples of ways to join wires. These are primarily suited to low voltage and low current situations. If you're working on high voltage or high current equipment such as mains voltage or large solar panels, if you do not feel competent, please consider consulting a professional. First, before we look at ways to do it, I'm going to share something I personally would never use. These are Scotch lock connectors. They seem easy and simple, but having had to fault find electrics that have been installed with these in the past, I think they're the work of the devil, leaving high resistant joints, intermittent connections and easily failing joints. There are loads of different ways to join wires. I'm going to share what I most commonly use. We'll talk through each one and then we'll see how they perform in a number of tests. Crimp on connectors are an easy way to connect wires. They're obviously a multitude of sizes and types which mean that they can be used for permanent connection or one that you may want to disconnect later. If you are using an insulated connector, then you may not need to worry about taping or heat shrinking the joint, depending on the environment the joint will be in. Using the right tool to crimp is important to stand the chance of them working well. I choose a ratchet crimper as it ensures the right amount of pressure is applied so you don't over compress the crimp. The first thing you need to do is select the right crimp for the job. So we're going to connect two wires permanently. And then you need to select the right crimp for the size of wire. Firstly, strip away the right amount of wire insulation to make sure that the wire meets in the middle where the actual metal crimp is. Twisting the wire makes it easier to insert it into the crimp. I find loading the crimp into the crimper first before putting the wire in makes it easier to handle. Make sure you install the crimp in the correct size jaws. And then squeeze and check that the crimp has worked. Now you can see with this crimp that although insulated, there is space for moisture to get into the join. So if you're mounting this outside, I would still suggest taping or heat shrinking over the top of the crimp. I'm now going to show you a couple of joins that don't use a crimp um, and are twisted together. If you're using heat shrink, don't forget to put this onto the wire before you make your join. When we are stripping the wire, you're going to need to expose more of the internal conductors than you do for a crimp to make a suitable twist. For this join, we're going to twist each side of the wire tightly together. and then twist the two wires together tightly again. Mm -hmm. 
Then the trick to making this more secure is to fold the wire in half and then in the same direction that you folded it, lay it against the wires before sliding the heat shrink or taping over the top. When using heat shrink, I like to use a soldering iron rather than a flame to shrink it down. I just think it gives a better finish uh, and is uh, less dangerous in a confined space. In this join, we expose the conductors as we did in the folded twist, but instead of twisting the wires together to start with, we actually spread out the individual conductors. And then interleave the conductors between each other. And then starting in the middle, twist the two wires together on either side of the join. This leaves you the nice neat join which you can then cover with the heat shrink or tape up for extra safety and insulation. The final join I often use is a soldered joint, so for this you will need a soldering iron and some solder. To begin with you do exactly the same as you did with the marriage joint. Then simply tin the tip of your soldering iron with a dab of solder. Apply this to the wire to heat up the wire and allow the solder to melt into the join. and once again insulate using heat shrink or tape. So now we've got our four different drawings, let's put them through a couple of tests. First we'll get an indication of how well the connection has been made in the join. All four of the joints appear to have a similar electrical characteristic measuring 0.4 ohms of resistance. When you join a wire you genuinely want it to stay together, so let's test how much strength is needed to pull the wire apart. As a benchmark let's just try the wire on its own with no join to see how much force it can take. Now the crimp on connector. The folded twist. Let's see how the married twist does. And finally, that soldered joint.
So here is a quick summary of how the joints performed and I've also ranked the cost per join and detailed the equipment needed. For permanent connections my choice is a solder joint if it's safe to get a heat source to it and if not a married twist. Where I want a connection that can be disconnected I'll use a crimp but be very careful to make sure it's not going to be under any tension. Where I can't be sure of this I'll sometimes even solder on the crimp. Coming soon, we'll share with you how we used a multimeter in our build, and how we continue to use it when tracing faults. Thanks for watching our video, and as always, if you have any questions or feedback, please pop them in the comments below. If you find the video useful, please like, share, and consider subscribing.